riding on steel. Steel from the melting shops of this famous Yorkshire steelworks, whose chimneys are a local landmark. In the melting shops are lines of open hearth furnaces, and mobile chargers traverse and swing with their loads of pig iron, selected scrap and alloys, which the furnaces will reduce to molten steel. Steel for billet and bar, strip and slab, axles and springs, tires and wheels nearly a million tons of steel every year. Generations of Yorkshire craftsmen have looped with practiced eye into furnaces like these. And though metallurgical science is constantly advancing, the judgment of the steel man is still a vital asset. It takes 10 to 12 hours to complete a melt, and when the clay filling is removed from the furnace tapple, the molten steel flows like a stream, lighting up the rear of the furnace and the men who work on this crucial operation. runs into one ladle and the overflow of slag into two separate ladles below, adding more light to the impressive scene. When the tapping is completed, the steel ladle is lifted and carried to the teeming stage where moulds have already been prepared. Ingots are cast in groups, a method known as uphill teaming or bottom pouring. The molten steel is released through the bottom of the ladle and teamed into a central runner. The steel runs through channels to the base of the moulds, filling them upward eight at a time. The ingots are still red hot when they're stripped. They are 12-sided and are destined for the forging and rolling of railway wheels and tires. Some 13 hours later, the coal ingots are taken to the breaker shop across the river Don. In the early days of steel making, the Don provided the power, but today, its water is used only for cooling. Before the ingots are broken, dividing lines are equally spaced with a template and nicks burnt on the surface of the ingot, so that the resulting blocks will be of correct weight and of equal size to produce one wheel from each block. A magnet crane lifts the ingot, a load of nearly two tons, over to the breaker. In the old days, they used to saw the ingots into blocks, a slow, tough job. Today, this modern machine breaks the 15-inch diameter ingots exactly on the nicked line. Here's another break, slowed down. Over 300 blocks a shift roll off the breaker to feed the wheel and tire mills. Then, 9 to 12 on a bogey, they're pushed through a continuous furnace to be heated in readiness for forging. The blocks ultimately reach a temperature of 1,200 degrees centigrade after several hours passage through this furnace. At the other end of the furnace, heated blocks are ready for forging, and that's where the charger comes into action. Its arm enters the furnace, 
grips the block with its steel fingers and withdraws it. Scale, which is formed on the surface of the hot metal, is cleared before the block can be forged. And a simple but effective method of revolving chains removes it from the top and bottom of each block. Under perfect control, the charger carries the block over to the forging press and drops it to release some of the side scale onto what is called the slabbing anvil. A wheel is being completed on the upper anvil and as it is taken away, the new block is placed in position under the ram of the forging press. At the first squeeze, any remaining scale is loosened and blown off by compressed air. Solid wheels have been produced here for some 25 years. This powerful press is also used for the production of disc centers. The final squeeze uses the full 6,000 tons pressure. The next block has just arrived, so continuity of production is maintained. The hole for the axle is made by pressing a punch through the wheel. forging is thicker and smaller in diameter than its ultimate size and it has to be rolled to correct dimensions. As however some heat has been lost during pressing, the forging is reheated to the specified rolling temperature. One wheel is placed in the furnace and another wheel, reheated, is taken out and delivered to the rolling mill. Water is sprayed to prevent any scale being rolled into the wheel. Rolling gives the wheel not only its correct thickness and diameter, but forms the tread and flange. taken out, another put in, production rolls on. The wheel is now the right size. To give it the right shape, it is placed in a dishing press. This presses the hub into correct position relative to the tread. It also gives the final contour to the web or plate and stamps the cast number which enables the wheel to be identified from steel furnace to stockroom and throughout its future life. And here's the dished wheel with its cast number. Depending on the ultimate use, certain classes of wheels are either allowed to cool freely in air or are sent for heat treatment. In the latter case, they are passed through a walking beam furnace. 
It is this heat treatment which governs the structure and tensile strength of the wheel. Quenching during heat treatment can be by water or oil. These particular wheels are quenched by sprays of water. The quenching quickly reduces the tread temperature from 850 to 550 degrees centigrade. So far, the wheels have been made to fairly close tolerances. Now they have to be machined to fine specification limits. Every part of the wheel is machined in its turn. A line of lathes, each taking two wheels, accurately machines them, and with a speed which the constant output of the wheel mill demands. Some wheels have holes cut in the web, an operation known as trepanning. With three cutters working simultaneously, the weight of the wheel is reduced. Boring the hub needs a particularly high degree of accuracy. It must be a perfect fit on the axle. This operation completes the wheel. If wheels alone are ordered, they are transferred for immediate dispatch. But if the instructions include axles, they take their place to await assembling. Unlike wheels, which, as you've seen, are press-forged, axles are hammer-forged. Blooms are delivered from the rolling mills and charged to a continuous furnace by magnet crane. The reheating and soaking in this furnace gradually bring the blooms to forging heat. They take approximately six hours to pass through and reach a temperature of 1200 degrees centigrade. At the other end of the furnace, a heated bloom is pushed out for the manipulator to take it in its grip. Traverse, and the bloom is placed under the seven-ton hammer. Top and bottom tools having various diameter holes to suit particular axles can be fitted to this hammer. These holes have two diameters, one for the body of the axle and the other for the journal. The journal, which will run in a bearing, is forged in the other hole of the hammer tool. When one half is completed, the axle is taken out and turned for the other half to be forged. Nearby, forged axles are rolling into the heat treatment furnace to be reheated to 850 degrees centigrade. 
they roll from the furnace onto a lift above the quenching tank. As with wheels, the form of treatment and quenching is calculated to meet the stress and load factors under operating conditions. In this case, quenching is in oil, and the length of their immersion depends upon predetermined factors. As with wheels, the axles are machined on a line of center lathes. They are prepared for this series of operations by being cut to exact length. They are centered as well. On most of the lathes, the axle ends are machined simultaneously. First, a roughing cut is made. From roughing, a series of machining operations turns the forgings into finished axles. This line can machine axles of various types and specifications. Railway equipment is not standardized even in any one country. And as we are producing for the world, machinery must be adaptable for many and different needs. This is an ingenious machine, a copying lathe. The stationary axle on top acts as a template. A needle pointing horizontally follows the contours of the template, and these contours are exactly reproduced by the cutter on the axle below. Bearing surfaces may be ground or burnished. This axle is being ground. The axle is laid in the machine and the two opposing grinding wheels move in on the bearings. Here are some of the different axles produced from those for passenger and freight rolling stock to locomotive and other axles with several bearing surfaces. Now you'll see how important is the accuracy of the machining operations. In assembling, the wheels are pressed on the axles and held only by the accuracy of the fit. Under a pressure of some 80 tons, the wheel takes its rigid and permanent place on the axle. Wheels, axles, and now springs. Steel from the bar mill is cut into length and then assembled to make springs of different sizes, shapes, and numbers of leaves. There are many variations to suit many purposes. Some have rolled ends, while others have them sheared and slotted.
center fastening can be with holes or nibs. For the last, the centers are heated under powerful gas jets before the nib is pressed in them. Whatever their size or shape, all spring leaves are sent through a furnace. This conditions them for the bending press, which has to curve or camber them. They reach a temperature of 950 degrees centigrade before they're taken out and cumbered. quenched in water or oil. It's oil in the case of these locomotive spring leaves. Each leaf must be set to fit its neighbor perfectly. Leaves may become slightly distorted as a result of hardening and tempering, so they have to be set during assembly. By pressing them together, the amount of variation and where it occurs can be seen. The setter's experienced eye tells him where adjustment is needed and how much pressure is required to obtain the correct camber. This complete locomotive spring has 22 leaves, each fitting perfect. During manufacture, each type of spring is cambered to a predetermined amount. After they're assembled, that camber is checked. This operation is known as scragging and consists of deflecting the spring by a specified amount and checking that it returns to the required permanent camber. All that remains is for the buckle or hoop to be fitted and pressed onto the spring. Not only heavy locomotive springs, but an infinite variety of sizes, shapes and numbers of leaves springs to suit almost anything on wheels may be produced by this process. Springs of this type are fitted to locomotives of Britain and overseas. Steam locomotives have spoke wheels with fitted tires. So perhaps we might finish by showing you how tires are made. As with solid wheels, they start as ingots, then blocks, which are heated ready for the forging press. is not forged into a molded shape like the wheel but pressed to the approximate thickness of the tire a central hole is punched partially from above and then finished from below This is the punch for finishing the central hole.
forging leaves the press rather like a small rough wheel. In a moment you'll see how this is rolled and enlarged. Before rolling it needs to be reheated and another charger takes it over. same continuity of production as with wheels and axles occurs here, so there's a constant supply of forgings for the roughing and finishing mills. This operation rough rolls and, at the same time, enlarges the forging so that it begins to assume the shape of a tire. The roughing mill only partially enlarges the forging. The final diameter and shape is attained in the finishing mill. An irregular ring of scrap is taken off to remove any excess metal from the face of the tire and water is sprayed to remove any scale. At this stage, a gauge is fitted to register the diameter of the tire as the rolls enlarge it. That upright pointer moves back with the enlarging tire rim until it reaches the stop. He is checking the diameter, which is 63 inches. The tires on this run are for Canadian locomotives. As with wheels and axles, the cast number has followed the steel throughout its manufacture and is finally stamped on the roll tires. From every cast, a percentage of tires is submitted to a falling weight test. It consists of dropping a tub weighing a ton, 30 to 35 feet, according to the particular tire being tested. Twenty drops are made so that the test tire is knocked out of shape. If it withstands such pounding without fracture and satisfies the other inspection requirements, the cast is accepted. Many sizes of tires are forged and rolled to be later machined for every type of railed vehicle. There is even a midget for mine cars. 
But the main output is, of course, material for railways. And so, from a corner of Yorkshire, come the tyres, the axles, the springs, and the wheels of Sheffield Steel for the railways of the world. <laughs>